All right, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us here today for the City of Madison's Budget and American Rescue Plan Town Hall. Today is Thursday, July 22nd at 4.30 p.m. Um, and we're so glad to have you join us here today. Before we get started into the content, I wanna cover a few housekeeping items. Um, if we can go to the next slide. And I should also introduce myself. My name is Christine Cohen. I'm the City Budget and Program Evaluation Manager. Um, as I mentioned, tonight's town hall is being live streamed. We're having two sessions. The first is tonight, and we are also having a second session next Tuesday, July 27th at 4 o'clock p.m. The sessions will be identical, so if you're here with us tonight, um, you can skip the next session, but we encourage you to spread the word and share the link with colleagues, partners, friends who might be interested. We'll be posting recordings and copies of the presentation on the city website at cityofmadison.com slash ARPA. And that will be the landing page for all of the information related to the American Rescue Plan Act. If you have questions throughout the presentation, you have two options for submitting them. The first is if you're watching the live stream, you can click the speech bubble in the live stream and that will send an email to the finance department um, and we'll collect questions that way. If you'd prefer to submit feedback anonymously, you can submit them through a survey at bit.ly slash Madison dash ARPA. Again, that's bitly slash Madison dash ARPA. We won't be answering questions live, but we will be posting an FAQ or frequently asked questions to the website after this town hall series. Also, um, this session tonight is being uh, streamed in English, and we are currently working on translating materials, and we'll be posting translated materials to the website to make sure that this information is accessible to all Madisonians. Uh, with that, I'd like to go to our agenda and cover um, the topics that, to provide an overview of the topics we'll be discussing tonight. Um, so some of you may have heard of the American Rescue Plan Act, which we'll refer to throughout this presentation as ARPA. Um, ARPA is a historic bill that invests in communities and will help Madison recover from the economic and social impacts of the pandemic. At the same time, it's one-time funding. Once it's spent, it's spent. Um, so we have to be strategic about how we're investing, which is why we want to explain the overall budget process and how federal funds interact with our annual budget. So for the first part, we'll do a budget 101, which provides an overview of the city budget, what our operating budget is, what our capital budget is, the services that the budget provides and our annual timeline. In part two, we'll transition to talking specifically about the, 22, uh, the 2022 budget. So this will cover some of the challenges we're facing, including the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as fiscal challenges um, that are structural within our budget. And finally, in part three, we'll focus on the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, we'll kind of preview all of the federal funding that is supporting COVID relief and recovery and talk about specific proposals that the city is investing in with ARPA funding. Um, you know, we hope that you leave this town hall with an understanding of our overall budget process and how we plan to continue to invest in the city's recovery. Um, before we get started with part one, I'd like to turn it over to Mayor Satya to ground this conversation in our city's values. Thank you, Christine. Um, and thanks everybody for joining us and uh, either live or for watching this live stream uh, in the future. I just wanna talk a little bit about how, uh, what we're doing here, both in terms of the overall city budget and our ARPA allocation is really grounded in our mission and values of the city. Um, in general, we do try and center our values and priorities in our budget making. Um, and we try and stay focused on what we heard in the process of updating the comprehensive plan, Imagine Madison. And you can find out more about Imagine Madison on the city's website. But we had a, a really uh, broad reaching engagement process around that planning. And um, it really is guiding a lot of uh, our efforts in budgeting going forward. Um, and at the end of the day, what we're trying to do through our general budget is to provide the basic services that our community needs um, to go about your daily lives. Um, so you can see here on the slide, our mission and our values. Uh, and I'll talk more uh, 
once we get to the section on ARPA about uh, how we specifically are trying to reflect some of those values in our ARPA allocation and the process that we went through to develop um, the use of those dollars. Um, but for now, I think it's just important to emphasize that when we do the budget every year, we are really trying to stay connected to what we heard from our community in the Imagine Madison process um, and to reflect our mission and our values. Thank you so much for that, Mayor. Um, and so now we'll jump into our, our agenda with Budget 101. I'm gonna turn it over to our Finance Director, Dave Schmidicki. Um, at the end of the session, we hope that you understand what is the city budget, how it's funded, and the services that we pay for. So Dave, I'll hand it to you. Thank you, Christine. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Christine said, what we hope to accomplish in this part of the uh, um, town hall is that you get a basic grounding in the city's budget. Uh, what is the budget? How do we uh, fund that budget? And what does the um, money that you provide through fees and taxes, uh, what services um, do the, does that pay for? Next slide, please. So let's just start with what is the budget? Uh, the city has effectively two budgets. One we call the capital budget, the other the operating budget. And think of those both as plans. So we're looking ahead to the next uh, year of how we're going to um, allocate uh, the funding that is provided through taxes and fees. Uh, for the upcoming year. It is required under state law that we uh, have a budget uh, and the budget has to contain certain information. It covers a one year period. Uh, we are on a calendar year uh, fiscal year, which is uh, different, for example, from the state of Wisconsin, which has a July 1st to June 30th fiscal year. So does the school district. Um, and the federal government, in contrast, has a fiscal year that runs from October 1st to September 30th. But cities in Wisconsin have um, a calendar year fiscal year. Uh, we also have, as a part of the capital budget, what we call a capital improvement plan. And that's a five-year outlook beyond the, the year ahead for the capital budget. And it's really uh, aimed at the fact that uh, what we call capital projects are often multi-year, uh, for example, uh, construction of a new building or um, uh, replacing or reconstructing a street. Those often take us uh, uh, two to three years and they need planning design in advance of that activity. Uh, the budgets are developed by city staff uh, and often uh, that input includes um, uh, community input, whether it's through uh, city committees or um, through other means of connecting with the community. For example, we have uh, what are called neighborhood resource teams in different parts of the city, consisting of community members and city staff, and they're often uh, a place where concepts come forward for the budget. Uh, ultimately, um, the, the budget is put together by staff. Uh, the mayor develops uh, a proposed budget, both on the operating and capital sides. It is then reviewed, amended, and approved by the Common Council. And um, that uh, process of review, amendment, and approval also includes public hearings and opportunities for the public to speak uh, around those issues that are in um, the proposed budget. And ultimately the council votes to approve that budget as well as to approve uh, the level of property taxes that need to be levied to pay for a large share of the budget. Finally, our budget has to be balanced, our operating budget. So what we uh, plan to spend has to be um, uh, equal to what we're taking in in revenues. We need to have a balanced budget. Next slide, please. So let's start with the capital budget. And uh, when we think about the capital budget, it's really uh, our physical infrastructure. So our streets, 
uh, our bike paths, our bike lanes, any sort of building improvements we might have to make, for example, uh, renovating a library, or we recently constructed a new um, uh, city fleet facility, and we're renovating our uh, bus maintenance and storage facility. Uh, we also invest money for affordable housing through the capital budget in concert with uh, private funds and federal tax credit dollars to try to expand the number of affordable housing units in the city. That's the capital budget. Um, it's important in the sense that we're investing in um, for the long term. So when you think about um, uh, buildings or roads or streets, uh, these are things that last uh, 10, 20, 30 years or longer. We also purchase equipment in the capital budget, uh, as well as develop systems such as computer systems. Um, the capital budget helps us advance goals on climate change and housing and other key issues. And it's paid for primarily through borrowing, but other sources as well. Next slide. The operating budget on the other hand is our day-to-day -day expenses. So it pays the salaries of city staff who in turn provide the services uh, that you see every day. Um, and some of those services are, for example, our libraries, uh, our park programs, our job training and childcare services, any of those types of programs we contract with nonprofit organizations uh, who in turn their staff provide those services, uh, picking up uh, uh, the garbage um, each week as well as recycling, uh, and then uh, some public safety, so our fire and uh, uh, police services. And again, that operating budget is uh, paid for primarily through property taxes as well as um, uh, user fees, and we get some state and federal aid uh, to support those costs. Next slide, please. So when we think about the city budget uh, and comparing it to a personal budget, the capital budget is uh, like purchasing, purchasing a house or buying a car. And you often take out a mortgage or a car loan and you pay that over a period of time because it's a significant asset. And you pay that in monthly installments usually. And at the end, you own the asset. The operating budget on the other hand is, uh, think of that as your checking account where you're um, spending out of that checking account every day. And it may be for things like rent or your mortgage, uh, food and utilities and so on. And you pay with that with uh, the money that you take in um, uh, with each paycheck, for example, or whatever other means. Our capital investments in the capital budget, uh, we often, for the most part, pay for that with debt, sort of like a loan or a mortgage. And um, the repayment of that debt shows up in our operating budget, much like it, a uh, mortgage payment shows up as something you have to pay out of your checking account. Next slide, please. So let's take a look at the overall budget. Uh, it's funded by many um, uh, sources. Um, when we look at the total budget, which is about $650 million, when we look at all of the uh, types of funding that comes in to pay for the budget. Um, some of that may include uh, sewer or water fees or parking uh, fees, for example, um, or the activities at Monona Terrace, all the activities that the city does. Uh, we focus on the general and library funds, which are about half of that total city budget uh, because that's paid for primarily by uh, the local property tax levy. Next slide, please. So focusing in on the general library funds, uh, for 2021, that total budget is about $350 million, and almost three quarters of that budget is paid for through property taxes. You can see on this slide, uh, it's about $255 million. Uh, the next um, largest category, which is much smaller than that, obviously, is state aid. And then a series of services um, or charges for services, uh, license fees, permit fees, for example, fines and forfeitures, um, 
all of these various uh, sm relatively small revenue sources overall help to fund uh, those, those services supported by the General Library Fund. Next slide, please. So that's how it's funded. Now, where does the uh, funding go? It pays for the services that you see on this slide. And about 40% is public safety and public health, meaning our police and fire departments, as well as our joint uh, public health department that we share with uh, Dane County. Uh, the next largest share is our streets division, sanitation, our metro transit, so what we call public works. And um, again, that's where um, uh, the cost of the, uh, providing um, garbage collection, re uh, refuse and recycling services, uh, snow and ice control, our parks, uh, and so on is funded there. And then you can see debt service is the third largest share, so paying the cost of our capital budget, the debt issue to pay for that is the third largest element of our budget. And you can see um, planning and development, public spaces, which includes libraries, um, are these major service areas supported by the general library funds. Next slide, please. So that's how the budget is funded and the services that are provided through the budget. And then we have a budget timeline. So each year we're putting together a budget, looking ahead as a plan for that subsequent year. And just to quickly go through um, as we, we basically spend the entire year putting together the budget and then we start again. Uh, at the beginning of the calendar year, we're taking a look at our services. What will it cost to um, maintain those services at their current level uh, in the upcoming year? We set priorities at that time. Next, we ask each of the city agencies to develop uh, an operating budget proposal and a capital budget proposal, and that runs through the spring and summer. And then the mayor takes those uh, requests, those ideas and concepts from the agencies and puts together a balanced budget, um, what we call the executive budget, both for the capital budget, which is uh, funded by the sources we talked about, primarily debt and the operating budget, um, half of which is the general library fund and which is primarily funded by the property tax. Once the mayor puts together that balanced budget, those budgets then go to the uh, council. And um, uh, in the fall, there are hearings held by the city's finance committee and um, public hearings uh, also occur. And um, the council then can amend the, the mayor's proposed budget and then ultimately approves the budget in November. Public participation in the public, uh, budget process, I mentioned neighborhood resource teams are one avenue. Uh, we also have um, surveys and planning processes. Um, various committees weigh in on elements of the services that are funded by the budget. and. Um, as I said, we have budget hearings every fall, both at the finance committee meetings as they're um, reviewing the budget and then at the uh, council meetings as the council as a whole is looking at the budget. Next slide, please. Great. Thanks so much, Dave, for providing that overview of the city's budget process. Now we're going to move into part two of our agenda, which is taking a closer look at the current situation and the 2022 budget. Specifically, we'll talk about two challenges. One is the impact of COVID on the budget, as well as our structural deficit. So I'm going to hand it back to you, Dave, to take us through this section. Thank you, Christine. So as Christine said, uh, our, what we've just talked about is uh, how the what is the budget? Uh, how we put it together, what it pays for. Uh, but most recently, we have a couple of challenges that we face each year uh, in the budget. The most present challenge is the pandemic's impact on the city budget. Again, um, our community, various elements of our community have felt uh, severe economic impacts from the pandemic. Um, it has resulted for the city in some very significant revenue losses that support services. Um, and when we look at the budget that we're in right now, the 2021 budget, 
we did have to rely on an unprecedented level of use of our rainy day fund. That's basically money that we set aside in reserve uh, for emergency situations like this, be sure we can pay our bills. And uh, we had to use $8 million from that fund. That's roughly a total of about um, $50 million that we uh, set aside and we have there for situations like this as well as to show that we have um, sound and prudent financial management um, uh, in the city. Um, so when we look at the general and library funds, uh, we had to use that fund balance, that rainy day fund, as I said. Uh, the pandemic's effect on the economies is, is expected to create yet another deficit as we're in the middle of the year right now of perhaps uh, a little less than $5 million. And then looking ahead as we're developing the budget for 2022, which if you recall that timeline we're in the middle of developing right now, we project an $18 million gap. So when I talked about our cost to continue process, meaning uh, our current services, how do we maintain those services? What's the cost? And we compare that to how much uh, revenue we think we're going to take in from the property tax and other sources, we have an $18 million gap. That's in the general library funds. When we look at our parking utility, which again is funded by um, uh, meter revenue, if you park on the street or if you park in a city uh, garage, you're paying um, an hourly rate there. Again, because of the effects of the pandemic, more people working from home, for example, this less economic activity uh, the parking utility lost a significant amount of revenues and its reserves, so the money that it has set aside to build or re uh, repair, in effect, and replace uh, ramps in the future has gone from $32 million down to $14 million. Um, as you have probably heard, uh, the leisure and hospitality industry has been heavily affected by the pandemic. And when we think about that in Madison, that's uh, primarily hotel stays. And um, we have a room tax in Madison. That's 10% uh, uh, on the uh, room rate that you, uh, you pay for a hotel room. We saw our revenues fall by almost 70%. And uh, we made over 50, we made 50 percent cuts to programs funded by the room tax. We still finished with an almost $2 million deficit. And then we expect another deficit this year in 2021. Again, because the recovery in that sector, particularly in urban centers like Madison, uh, is going to be um, uh, very slow. And then Monona Terrace, again, a place that's a, a, a travel and um, conferences, uh, its reserves have been um, uh, eliminated in effect by the loss of revenues, and it's lost uh, three and a half million dollars in cash uh, because of uh, the significant drop in activity due to pan due to the pandemic. Next slide, please. So the city has has taken some um, immediate action uh, throughout 2020, as well as in the year we're in right now, 2021. Uh, we um, uh, had city staff participate in the uh, federal work share program, which uh, basically reduced hours for city staff. And then um, uh, there was uh, federal funding available uh, to pay for those uh, lost hours, pay uh, uh, employees for those lost hours. Um, we also uh, delayed the hiring of vacant positions. We reduced um, our uh, costs because of fewer conferences and training uh, activities. Uh, we just stopped, we reduced our spending on equipment and supplies. We also reduced some public services. Some uh, library branches had fewer hours and um, we created an overnight schedule for snow removal, for example. All of these reductions, when we look at our 2021 budget that we're in right now, saved almost $4 million in both permanent cuts as well as one-time cuts, again, to help uh, ameliorate, address uh, some of those um, 
uh, shortfalls, those revenue shortfalls due to the pandemic uh, and the fact that we have to continue to provide services through the pandemic. Um, and uh, so we had that mismatch and needed to um, uh, take the action that's listed here. Next slide, please. So what I just described is our first challenge, that immediate challenge of the, uh, the severe economic effects um, due to the pandemic. And that's really on top of our second challenge. And that's a challenge we have every year. And it's what we call a structural deficit. And what, what we mean by that is when we look at that, um, that cost to continue current services every year, and we compare it with how much revenue we're able to bring in each year uh, under the property tax or um, other revenue sources, uh, that cost of continuing current services is higher than the amount of money that we take in in revenues to pay for those services. And when we project that out over the next five years and add up that difference each year, it totals about $50 million under a, a set of assumptions. And so that is our challenge with each and every budget of how do we maintain uh, services at the level that's expected with the uh, amount of revenue that the city can take in. Uh, again, primarily through the property tax, but also um, uh, other revenue sources. Next slide, please. So what are some of the factors that create that structural deficit? So clearly we have the services that the city provides. Um, as I said, services like uh, plowing snow or picking up the trash or ensuring public safety um, and uh, community services, our libraries, our parks, and so on. But one of the key elements of that structural gap that we have, that structural deficit as we call it, is cities in Wisconsin, uh, Madison as a city in Wisconsin, the state legislature severely limits uh, our ability to raise revenue. So we need the approval of the state legislature uh, for any sort of revenue made uh, broad-based revenue sources. For example, many cities around the country have a sales tax that can fund city services. We, we um, are not allowed to do that under Wisconsin law. That is not authorized. We need the legislature to approve something like that. We also have other restrictions, which in effect make uh, us very reliant on property taxes. And then um, exemptions that have been approved by the state legislature means that that property tax falls even uh, a larger proportion on residences, so on homes, uh, as opposed to um, uh, other property. So the state legislature goes further uh, to, to control our rate of growth and revenues through what's called a levy limit. So our growth in property taxes cannot maintain the pace of uh, our cost growth to maintain current services because of this limit. In addition, uh, state aid, so as you remember from that previous slide, that's the second largest revenue source for the city's general library fund budget. It's, it's primary um, uh, fund that supports our major services, uh, that has not kept pace with costs. In fact, since 2003, uh, aid statewide to cities has been cut by nearly $100 million. And so it not only has not kept pace with inflation, it's lower than it was almost 20 years ago. And then as a most recent example, the state legislature cut aid that the city receives from the state for transit services in half uh, in this um, uh, upcoming budget. So when we look to our, our 2022 budget for transit, that state aid was cut in half. So that's a severe uh, 
limiter and, and um, a severe limit for the city. And it's what creates a, a major out part of that structural deficit uh, that we uh, that I just described. The other factor is um, our local service needs expand each year. Our population is growing about 1% a year. Um, and that means we need more community services. Uh, we need to expand our bus service, expand our library service, public health, uh, our public safety services, our parks, more demands there. And um, uh, the, the geographic extent of the city and the number of uh, streets we have to plow or um, uh, the amount of trash we need to pick up all expands. When we look at the services that the city provides and the cost to provide those services, personnel costs are about 61% of that total amount in the general library fund. Of course, there's cost drivers there. We want to have competitive wages. And we do that through longevity bonuses, through education stipends for some um, staff, as well as making sure that all staff have equitable wage increases. Uh, and that's been a particular challenge uh, since um, what is called Act 10 went into place about 10 years ago, which uh, uh, stripped away uh, collective bargaining rights for most public employees in Wisconsin. And then we have, as every um, business has, uh, for example, uh, we have increases in health insurance costs and retirement contribution costs each year. And then we have to keep pace with the cost of living for city staff, meaning those, um, those wage issues, as well as for nonprofit organizations that the city contracts with to deliver a lot of services to residents. And they have cost of living pressures as well. Next slide, please. So we take all that, those two challenges, and we put it together as we're developing this upcoming budget for 2022. And as I said, when we look at both um, our very constrained revenues due to the state legislature and our um, uh, growing service needs, we put that together and we combine that with the economic effects of the pandemic, we have an $18 million uh, deficit you know, when we look at that, the cost of continued current services. Agencies um, are in the process and have been in the process of looking at their services that they deliver, how much did it cost to do that? And they have made proposals for, um, for 2022. And the city will need to prioritize which of those services are the highest priority, uh, look, continue to look for efficiencies, and we'll probably have to look at some hard choices uh, of things that might have to be reduced or possibly eliminated to balance the budget. Now, this is a challenging climate, and we will continue, however, to focus on racial equity and social justice. That is a key value, a top value, uh, for the city, and it's the lens through which we look for everything that we do. And um, to reinforce that uh, and to build on that, agencies were asked to explain how their services advance those racial equity and social justice goals, particularly for any sort of proposals that might uh, reduce services. And then starting in the budget after this upcoming one in 2023, we're implementing something called Results Madison. Again, along those lines of racial equity and social justice, focusing our budget on service outcomes, meaning what, is, what are the results that we want services to um, uh, realize, uh, particularly in terms of what our residents expect, expect and how do we focus our budget um, towards those outcomes and results and measure our performance. And that'll be a multi-year implementation. Next slide, please. So thanks for that, Dave. Um, so we've made it about two thirds through our agenda. We're gonna 
enter the final part, which is the focus on the American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA. Um, Dave will provide an overview of the how much funding the city is receiving, as well as the strategy for allocating those funds. And then the mayor and agency staff will provide more detailed descriptions of the proposals for community investments and building back the uh, Madison. So Dave, I'll hand it over back to you. Thank you, Christine. Um, again, we'll talk about the American Rescue Plan Act and give a little background on that to start. Next slide, please. So when we talk about ARPA, the American Rescue Plan Act, uh, it's really um, the latest in what has been several uh, pieces of legislation enacted by Congress uh, to provide relief and recovery funding from the pandemic. Uh, the total of all of those um, uh, efforts that have been enacted by Congress is over $5 trillion. That's trillion with a T. And um, when we look at how that um, affects Madison, um, we're seeing funding received by not only the city, but also the county, Dane County, uh, the school district, Madison Metropolitan School District, the state of Wisconsin has received allocations. And just to give you some examples, uh, over $70 million by the school district. Uh, within the city budget, uh, our Metro Transit um, uh, activity service has uh, received almost or will receive almost $70 million. We've also received uh, emergency rental assistance, and this is just the city's allocation of over $23 million. The county has also received that money, and as has the state of Wisconsin, which is in turn allocating its share uh, to local communities such as Madison. And then just in 2021 alone, um, over $12 million for the public health elements of uh, responding to the pandemic. Next slide, please. So when we look uh, solely at the ARPA funding, which at the national level is about a 1.9 trillion, again with a T, um, uh, uh, amount of funding through uh, legislation uh, enacted by Congress. Um, first of all, this funding is one time uh, the amount of money that the, the city will receive. And it's really that focus on uh, responding to the pandemic, as well as recovering from the economic effects of the pandemic. But it is one-time funding. How the funding can be used is defined by both what was in the act itself, as well as rules that have been put together by the United States Department of Treasury. Our proposal uh, for use of those funds in the city, it looks to balance multiple priorities, and when we look at the sort of five areas where those where the funding received by the city can be spent, um, and those five areas are public health, economic hardship, revenue loss, uh, premium pay to um, essential workers, and then infrastructure investments. The funding the city is receiving will focus on uh, economic hardship, meaning we're uh, focusing on supporting families, small businesses, and those hardest hit industries, as well as um, uh, the revenue loss component, meaning, as I described earlier, we've lost a considerable amount of revenue that supports public services in the city, and some of this uh, ARPA funding will be used to replace that lost revenue so that we can maintain those key government services. Next slide, please. So when we talk about the ARPA funding, and this is the funding uh, that's a component of the overall um, $1.9 trillion that's targeted to local governments uh, for their response and recovery efforts. The city's share is $47.2 million. That's what we've been allocated. We will get that money in two different, what are called tranches, or installments, and we can spend that money between uh, for costs that occur between last March, March of 2021, 
through the end of 2024. Uh, what the mayor has put together in terms of how to allocate those dollars and that allocation has been approved by the Common Council is a roughly 50-50 uh, split of the funding towards community investments, meaning that economic hardship component that I described. And um, again, uh, for one-time uh, investments, because we can't, this is one-time money, we can't create new ongoing programs um, since this money will eventually go away. Most of the funding will be allocated immediately uh, to have a greater impact on community needs. The other half of the funding, about a little over 24 million, will uh, be used, as I said, to replace that lost revenue to help us maintain those key services that are supported by the general fund and to um, avoid uh, further use of our rainy day funds um, to keep the city uh, programs going. And then to help with uh, those programs that have been uh, dramatically affected uh, from an economic perspective, meaning those, um, uh, the Menorah Terrace, as well as room tax supported activities, such as uh, the Overture Center and um, the marketing of the city by our uh, Convention and Visitors Bureau. Next slide, please. So when we think about um, the revenue replacement and um, what I talked about in terms of the effect of the pandemic, uh, we have taken a look using the methodology developed by the um, United States Department of Treasury, and they've set up a um, pretty comprehensive methodology or calculation of how we determine how much revenue we have lost because of the pandemic. And we compare what our revenues would have been if the pandemic had not happened with our actual revenues each year over the next uh, uh, four years. And we, we looked at uh, revenues through December of 2020. So for that year of 2020, and we'll look at 2021, 2022, and 2023. Just in 2020 alone, we lost almost $45 million in revenue. So almost equal to the amount of funding we are receiving, the $47 million we're receiving under ARPA. But because of the uh, importance of the community investments and the need to build back better in the community, uh, we, the, the mayor and the council are allocating half of that 47 million in the community, as I described before. The other half to try to replace what is gonna be at least $45 million of revenue losses, and we expect that revenue loss to continue uh, over the next um, three years. Next slide, please. Okay, thanks, Dave, for that a comprehensive overview of the city's budget, the 22 situation, and the use of ARPA funds. I just want to remind folks who are watching live that you can submit any questions you may have about the budget process in general or about ARPA funding by clicking the speech bubble, which will send an email to the finance department or by going to cityofmadison.com slash ARPA, and that'll link you to an anonymous survey where you can submit questions. Um, for the rest of the presentation, I wanna hand it off to the mayor to talk about the priority areas for ARPA funding and community investments. Thanks, Christine. So on the slide here, you can see the five broad areas that we are uh, dedicating our community ARPA investments in. Um, I'll talk a little bit uh, first about how we came to these um, and then a little bit about each of them. And then we're gonna go through some of the uh, projects that we're gonna be funding uh, with the ARPA dollars. So the, the basis for all of this is the needs that we have seen in the community over the last year and a half. Um, that either are due to COVID or are made worse by COVID or were really highlighted um, by the pandemic. And there's an, a number of things that um, we, I think as a community experienced um, due to the pandemic uh, where it's become clear the disparities or inequities um, 
or needs that our community is experiencing. So staff uh, have been, you know, tracking that, trying to respond to that throughout the entire year and a half, um, and we've been sort of keeping uh, lists of places that need our investment and work um, over time. And the ARPA funding is a, a, a opportunity for us to meet some of those needs that we've been tracking. Um, I also had one-on-one -on -one conversations uh, with all the members of the city council to see what they were experiencing in their districts, uh, what needs they saw in the community and what priorities they had for city spending. Um, and we matched those up uh, with my priorities and what we're hearing uh, from the community. And what you get is these five buckets um, of projects. Um, we also then looked at where are the gaps in our existing programs and funding streams. Um, so we're trying to not um, duplicate effort. Uh, so for example, if there is a, a state program or a county program already, we don't need to create our own version of that uh, for the most part. Um, and, and or if there is a, a city program that is meeting the needs sufficiently, um, we didn't want to duplicate that effort either. Um, uh, and then the other sort of overarching thing here is that um, we're trying to both meet some of the immediate needs that were created by the pandemic. And we're trying to invest in long-term solutions that will change our trajectory as a city. Um, and so it, what you see is a real uh, broad swath of different kinds of investments here. Again, some of which are immediate, um, you know, programming funds, um, supporting rental assistance, et cetera, uh, and some things that are much longer term investments that will uh, set us up for long term success. So just to quickly run through here, um, the first category is violence prevention and youth engagement. Um, and so there's some short term um, work here, but then uh, we're also trying to really lean into uh, our larger work around violence prevention. Um, in the community and support the work that's been coming out of our public health department. And, um, you know, this is has been a, a long term need in Madison, which has really been exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, and it's um, it's good to be able to uh, to fund some of the work here uh, that needs to be done. The second bucket is homelessness support. This is, again, obviously an area where we've seen a lot of additional need due to the pandemic um, and the need to provide shelter options um, that are healthy and safe for people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, the city did a lot of work uh, over the course of the last year and a half. Um, we moved, uh, created and moved folks to two different temporary shelters um, help to create a new tiny house village, um, help to support the county in their work to provide hotel rooms to folks experiencing homelessness and a whole swath of, of other work uh, that continues to until today. Um, so uh, this again is a mixture of um, sort of immediate needs um, that we're trying to meet and making some long-term investments in creating a better shelter situation for folks that are experiencing homelessness. The next bucket is affordable housing. This is a high priority for me personally and, uh, and for the city uh, at large. Um, and uh, this is a, an ongoing need. Um, and these funds will allow us to um, do some, I think, really innovative uh, and interesting work in addition to supporting our ongoing work to create more affordable housing uh, in the city of Madison. The next category is neighborhood and small business support. Um, as Dave said earlier, uh, a lot of our small businesses were pretty hard hit by the pandemic and um, have a lot of needs coming out of it. And so we're trying to leverage the ARPA funding um, to support uh, our small businesses and our neighborhood business districts um, to be successful, to attract customers um, and to sort of smooth out uh, the, the bump uh, in the road that was the pandemic. 
Um, there's a lot of other great programs uh, that are designed to support small businesses as well, directly from the federal government, the state, and the county. And so we're trying to to use our funds strategically to support things um, that aren't being supported by other levels of government. And then the last category is a little bit of a catch-all. It's around basic needs and um, emerging issues. Um, some of this is um, going to fund out proposals that had come to the city that we did not have sufficient funds um, around meeting basic needs or connecting folks to services in the community. Um, some of it is to support uh, our senior community and our senior center. Um, some of it is to support undocumented folks in the community. Um, but there was just a, a short list of things that we felt like were important investments to make um, that didn't fit in one of the other categories. Um, so that's the, the big picture. Uh, what we're going to do now um, is go through each of these categories and talk about some of the projects in a little bit more depth. So if I can have the next slide. Um, the first one that we're talking about is our violence prevention. Um, and again, as I said, this is uh, not a new issue, but definitely one that has been made worse by COVID-19. Um, and it is also one where we're, we're set up uh, for successful investments because we have a framework for this work already. So I'm going to turn it over to Ariel Smith to talk a little bit more about what this investment is. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ariel Smith, and I am the Director of Policy Planning and Evaluation for Public Health Madison, Dane County, and Violence Prevention, Violence Prevention sits in that shop. Um, as the mayor mentioned, the violence prevention initiatives supported by public health are a priority for this funding and critical to supporting community investment in violence prevention and safety efforts. Um, given its exasperation throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, we are looking to invest a total of $1.2 million into these efforts with an ask that 160,000 of that $1.2 million be allocated in 2021 to help us launch some of the project services and initiatives that we've identified could be launched this year. Public health has worked to create a comprehensive violence prevention plan, um, also known as our Madison and Dane County Violence Prevention Roadmap to Reduction. Um, in this roadmap, it outlines goals, strategies, and initiatives that aim to reduce violence in our community. Um, this plan aims to create a holistic approach to violence prevention that not only just focuses on the prevention lens, but also sheds some light into some work that needs to be done around intervention and also the healing of violence. The violence prevention roadmap creation process was conducted with input and feedback from partners and organizations, all working within the realms of violence prevention, intervention, and healing. Um, we also incorporated strategies that are evidence-based, innovative, and specific to the needs of our community in this process. So uh, just as an overview, some of our overarching goals in the roadmap are, um, number one, understanding violence in our community through data. Number two, supporting community engagement with children, youth, and families. Number three, fostering strong neighborhoods. Number four, bolstering and increasing intervention and continuous healing for those affected by violence. And number five, strengthening community capacity, engagement, and coordination of violence prevention efforts. And so these goals are, for, are further supported by our Madison and Dane County Violence Prevention Coalition, which reconvened on June 30th, 2021. Um, the coalition consists of a diverse group of violence prevention, intervention, and healing providers, um, community organizations, and other individuals who are invested in violence prevention in our community. And so at this reconvening of the coalition, our group of stakeholders established priorities for 2021 based on the roadmaps, goals, and strategies and initiatives. Therefore, the proposed ARPA funding allocation would support the priorities and work of the coalition by supporting the implementation and deployment of those strategies, initiatives, and programming that the coalition has uh, selected in order to support violence reduction. Um, a few examples of the priorities that have been identified that may that funding could potentially support include the creation of a violence data dashboard, 
um, supporting with programming and initiatives aimed at increasing father-child connectedness, including opportunities for system-involved fathers, and also the creation of streamlined referral mechanisms and systems for access to services, crisis intervention, and trauma-informed care and treatment services. So those are just a few that the coalition has identified as we continue to do work on um, some of the proposals and priorities that are coming forth. So again, those initiatives and strategies funded um, would be in alignment with the goals and strategies outlined in the roadmap. And those would also be dispersed via request for proposals or RFP. Public Health Madison and Dane County will work with the Madison and Dane County Violence Prevention Coalition to develop these RFPs. And we anticipate that those RFP announcements would occur later this year. Um, I know that was a lot that I just went over, but for more information about the Violence Prevention Roadmap or Coalition or other work that Public Health Madison Dane County is conducting around violence prevention, please feel free to visit our website at publichealthmdc.com slash B as in violence and P for prevention. I'll hand it back to the mayor. Thanks, Ariel. Um, our next project that we're going to talk about uh, is in this the same first bucket, and it's uh, if we can. Oh, there's the next slide. It's about expanding uh, youth employment and engagement opportunities. And um, before I hand it over to our CDD staff, um, or excuse me, our community development division staff, um, I should have said that we're uh, featuring projects that, um, for the most part, are going to start essentially now or at least in 21 um, and that uh, so we're not going over all of the projects uh, that are funding by funded by ARPA um, there are more that will be uh, implemented through the 2022 budget but we wanted to highlight the the things that are coming to the community sooner uh, rather than later and uh, to go into detail so I'll hand it now over to Jim O'Keefe who's the director of our community development division thank you mayor um, and welcome to everybody listening in. Um, I am the uh, serving as a city's community development director, and um, a, as such, as you might imagine, I'm very pleased that the mayor and the and the council um, saw fit to uh, devote a good portion of the ARPA funds to community investments and and community services. Though these are one-time funds, um, I'm convinced that the activities that they will be um, supporting will provide long-term benefits to the community and, and to residents. So the city devotes considerable time and, and energy and resources to supporting youth and families in, in a whole host of different ways, from promoting quality early childcare to supporting structured out-of-school time activities and youth leadership development programming. All of this is done with the knowledge that positive youth experiences lay the foundation for a lifetime of success and with the knowledge that making these resources and these opportunities available to youth from marginalized communities and, and lower income households can help close achievement gaps that persist in Madison and Dane County around education and employment and housing stability. One area we pay particular attention to is youth employment. Normally the city invests almost a million dollars in partnerships with a variety of nonprofit groups that help youth aged 14 to 21 gain their first job experiences or explore possible uh, career paths. Groups like Mentoring Positives, a local organization that worked with youth to make and sell locally uh, products like off-the-shelf salsa and pizza, or Operation Fresh Start, um, an organization that engages youth work crews in conservation and park and greenway projects, or Commonwealth Development, a group that pairs youth with private businesses and local government, including the city of Madison, uh, in job and internship opportunities, or CEOs of Tomorrow, an agency that gives young people a taste of what's involved in creating new business. Nearly a dozen different agencies in all that offer paid employment opportunities for upwards of 550 young people, uh, and that provide them with job experiences and training and other skills that will contribute to their future success. Now, some young people have ready access to these kinds of opportunities through family or other social connections. These programs are really focused on those for whom such um, opportunities may not be so easily available. 
The COVID-19 pandemic had a very significant impact on this work. Um, it, by, by dramatically reducing um, employment opportunities, eliminating many uh, summer jobs as businesses closed or, or were forced to downsize and severely limiting in other ways, the ability of community partners to work with youth. Not only added to the isolation and the loss of personal interactions uh, that young people were already experiencing during the course of the, of the pandemic, which uh, we think made it all the more important as we emerged from the pandemic to resume and expand these programs. Earlier this year, anticipating a return to a more normal summer, the mayor was able to find some additional money to support expanded youth employment efforts for the summer and, and fall of this year. We asked our community partners how they could use that money to expand um, in, in a formal request for proposals process. And they responded enthusiastically with program proposals that went far beyond what we were able to support. And so the money in this, some of the money in this um, ARPA plan will step in and help support many of the proposals that we were not able to earlier this year, providing paid opportunities to over 60 additional youth uh, this summer and fall, and then sustaining and building upon them next year. Uh, we'll be investing over the next couple of years, um, more than a million dollars in, in expanded youth employment programming. And it will also allow the city to launch an initiative that will offer um, city park space this summer, places where youth can take part in loosely structured activities that will get them outdoors and active and engaged with friends and neighbors and, and peers. So we look uh, forward to implementing uh, this additional funding and, and working with our community partners to do that. Thanks, Jim. Uh, so the next category is the, the homeless support category. And, um, you know, as I said earlier, this has been an area that is really highlighted uh, by the pandemic. Um, our homeless our experiences, our neighbors that are experiencing homelessness have um, had a lot of challenges um, during the pandemic. And uh, we've had to do a lot to adjust to support them. Um, and between the the city and the county and the state, um, there's been a lot of work done, a lot of um, money spent to get people uh, into safe situations in the immediate term um, and uh, to try and create better long-term solutions. So um, this again is uh, something where we're looking at, to continue to try and solve some of the immediate problems um, and to invest in longer-term solutions that could really change how we uh, deal with and, and address homelessness in the city of Madison, um, at, and some of which I think are really exciting and important for our community. So um, there's a lot of detail here, but to, to give just one level down, I'm gonna turn it back over to Jim. Thank you again, Mayor. <clears throat> yes, too many households in Madison have a difficult time finding and maintaining housing that they can afford and sustain. Um, it's an issue that, as the mayor said, the city has long struggled with, and we continue to respond to it on many different fronts. At its most extreme, this situation can place individuals or families in a position of extreme vulnerability without any housing. Based on organized surveys that we conduct twice a year, we know that on any given night in Madison and Dane County, as many as 800 people may be experiencing homelessness, numbers that have increased here just as they have across the country. One place for people to turn is our emergency shelter system. But for many years, shelter providers in Madison have had to rely upon small spaces in the basements of downtown churches and former school buildings. Even under normal circumstances and despite the best efforts of shelter providers and volunteers, these, are, these were cramped and very difficult spaces in which to serve guests. And when COVID-19 emerged, they were determined to be unsafe, unfit um, for, for that use, and they were forced to close. The mayor mentioned that the city and the county um, and shelter providers turned to a variety of alternative temporary locations to continue to, to provide shelter services using local hotels, uh, the city-owned 
um, properties like the Warner Park Community Recreation Center, the former fleet services facility. We helped convert um, a former nursing home um, to shelter use. But the situation made clear, um, even more clear to policymakers in the community, the need for better and safer spaces that can serve people with dignity. Purpose-built shelters that can um, offer short-term emergency shelter to people that need it and provide the services that can help them return to stable housing. Plans are already in place to construct a new shelter facility that will serve families and single women experiencing homelessness. And the city and county are working together to do the same for a shelter that will serve single men. This plan draws on ARPA funds to support both of those efforts. In the case of the men's shelter, adding $2 million to funding commitments that have already been made by both the city and the, and the county to build a new shelter and providing additional funds for future operating expenses. The plan also sets aside an additional $2.5 million that can go toward the planned shelter for families and single women. So badly needed funds for two very high priority projects. But we also know that our shelter system does not work for everyone. And as a result, there are a number of people who are unsheltered living on city streets or under bridges or camping in parks. And so even as we work with building better shelter facilities um, that can serve the needs of, of, of people experiencing homelessness, we are mindful of the need to support those in our community who are unsheltered. One alternative to shelter that has gained some support in Madison is the development of tiny house villages, small clusters of dwellings that share water and bathroom facilities and other amenities. There's funding in this plan, $2 million in all for use in expanding these um, approaches and supporting other similar arrangements that could provide other options for those un unable or unwilling to use our shelter system. And the plan provides $150,000 to support already existing tiny house villages, um, providing the means to use solar panels to support um, those structures and reducing the operating costs of the villages for those who live in them. Thanks, Jim. So our next, we're moving on then to the next category, which is affordable housing. Um, and again, this is not a new problem for the city of Madison. Uh, we have been in a housing crisis uh, for some years now, and particularly an affordable housing crisis. Um, but we know that that's been made worse by the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, so we're trying to pay attention to that as we think about how to use our ARPA funding. Um, again, this is a place where the city is doing a lot of work already. Um, and uh, we have uh, taken a number of approaches to create more affordable housing. Um, but uh, we know that there's some immediate need uh, around helping people stay in the housing that they have uh, and not be displaced or made homeless um, by economic issues due to COVID-19, um, while at the same time trying to continue uh, and to bolster our work to create more affordable options. Um, both uh, rental affordable options and uh, affordable ownership options uh, for the long term in the city. Um, so this is going to be building on the work that we uh, already do, but I think will will allow us to do some interesting and innovative things in addition to uh, our regular work around affordable housing. So Jim is going to give again uh, the next layer down of detail. Um, it's a, a large area of work for us, um, but some really exciting stuff. Thank you again, Mayor. Um, there is nothing more fundamental to a person's safety and well being than having a stable place to live. Earlier this year, the mayor released Housing Forward, a far reaching plan to meet the city's housing needs um, over the next 10 years or more. Among Housing Forward's goals that are um, immediately relevant to today's conversation is one that focuses on helping to develop full service shelter facilities to meet. Um, as we talked about earlier, the temporary needs of people in Madison who experience homelessness. Um, and, and we um, just covered the elements of this plan that support that effort. 
But Housing Forward goes much further. It calls on the city to help bring about the development of more affordable rental housing and more housing choices more generally to help prevent evictions and take other steps that allow people who are currently stably housed but might need a little help to remain in their homes and to expand home ownership opportunities, particularly among households of color for whom rates of home ownership lag far behind those for their white counterparts. The ARPA plan contributes to a number of these goals. Um, it includes a rare instance, it's one of the, the few instances in, in this um, package in which some funds are set aside to pay for city staff. Um, you heard earlier from Dave Schmidke that Congress has provided substantial help to cities to be used to help renters who have fallen behind on their rents and who risk being evicted be, uh, because um, perhaps they've lost uh, um, income or, or employment um, as a result of the pandemic. Madison has, as you saw, about $23 million available to help prevent evictions. And the city staff that uh, this plan will allow us to hire will help, help make sure that that $23 million gets to the people in our community who need it. But most of the money set aside um, in this part of the plan uh, looks ahead a bit further because the activities that they intend to support are are larger and take um, additional time to plan for and to implement. Uh, they include providing funds to explore the possibility of converting a hotel into permanent low cost housing, a strategy that has been undertaken successfully in cities across the country. There's two and a half million dollars um, to contribute toward uh, such an initiative. Converting a hotel to, to housing can happen uh, much more quickly than building a new apartment building and, and at less expense. Um, and it, it can, it, it provides an opportunity to take advantage of one of the negative consequences from the pandemic. Um, as Dave mentioned, the, the impact um, on the, the leisure and entertainment history, industry um, and turn it into a positive. Um, so we're excited about uh, pursuing that. Uh, prospect. The um, plan provides um, $2 million to partner with local nonprofit organizations to develop housing for youth who um, often uh, by aging out of foster care um, and other situations face the prospect of becoming homelessness. Um, so, so work we hope to do in this area will uh, replace a property that um, had previously served youth um, that has um, in recent years closed and we'd like to, um, to develop new housing uh, for this part of the, of the community. Uh, there is a million dollars um, set aside in this plan to create a fund that could be used under certain circumstances to help uh, make repairs to apartments, um, helping to make them available more quickly to the next renter and perhaps reducing the need for large security deposits that often stand in the way for some renters uh, to be able to afford a lease. And finally, there's money here to um, help um, expand the city's efforts um, to assist households of color who've often been closed out of the housing market, um, help put them in a position to purchase a home. So these are very um, ambitious and, and important proposals. Um, to a great degree, they reinforce and expand on um, other efforts that are already underway, as the mayor mentioned, um, and, and really improve our prospects for success in them. Thanks, Jim. And uh, our next and last project that we're going to highlight is in the neighborhood and small business uh, revitalization category. Um, and again, this is, a, a, you know, there's a lot of harm done by the COVID-19 pandemic, um, not least of which is the loss of life, but um, one of the uh, harder economic consequences has been the impact on our small businesses. And there's been a lot of work to try and directly help um, different businesses in Madison, again, from the federal government, from the state and from the county. Um, and the city has done some direct grant work as well. Um, but as we thought about uh, spending these dollars and how we could best support uh, our neighborhood business districts and uh, small business recovery in the city, 
Uh, we wanted to look at some broader programs um, to do that work. And so to, to talk about those programs and uh, the work that we're planning on, I'm going to turn it over to Matt Miklajewski. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening, everyone. I'm Matt Miklajewski, the Economic Development Director for the City. And this evening, I'm going to speak a little bit about some of the small business related programs in the ARPA funding. Uh, as noted, about $4 million has been included for neighborhood and small business revitalization. And really, the goal is, as the mayor indicated, we know that our small businesses and our small business districts have been so negatively impacted by the COVID pandemic. And really, the purpose of these funds is to help those business and business districts recover but also to build back to better, uh, to really take a look at what can be done to help develop uh, a healthier and stronger small business community, especially among and within our entrepreneurs of color. Uh, to that end, there's several initiatives that will be funded through this ARPA support. The first is continued funding of our Small Business Equity and Recovery Program, otherwise known as SBER. To date, the city has provided over $2 million to around 400 small businesses that are owned by historically disadvantaged individuals. And these grants to date have really been focused on immediate COVID recovery or COVID response. What we wanna do now is to look at recovery. And there's several initiatives under SBER that we intend to provide funding to businesses, especially businesses owned by historically underrepresented individuals to help them start and grow small businesses within the Madison community. The second item is our Retail Building Improvement Grant Program. Funding for this program will be used to help entrepreneurs with building out the interior of a new retail space. So this will be for new business owners or existing business owners interested in expanding or changing their space to assist with the very costly improvements, interior improvements for doing so. This can be everything from plumbing and electrical work to cosmetic work that may be needed for a small business owner, especially a retail business owner, to be successful within their commercial space. This will be structured as a grant program, uh, so funding will not need to be repaid to the city, and it'll help not only those individual business owners, but it'll help the city generally in terms of fixing up some of our retail spaces. As Dave Schmidtke indicated earlier, property taxes are an important part of the city's funding, and this will help leverage additional private investment that will in turn help support the city's tax base. We also have some support for the Public Market Foundation. The public market continues to be a very important and useful project for the city in promoting food entrepreneurship. And this is one area where we can really see new entrepreneurship within communities of color. And the public market, like many other projects, has been delayed because of the COVID pandemic in part. And so this funding will be used to help bridge that gap between where we thought we were gonna be relative to construction of the public market and the more likely schedule that we're gonna see over the next couple of years with construction starting in fall of 2022. The next item on the list is our Neighborhood Business District Support Program. Just as individual businesses have been significantly impacted by COVID, our business districts as a whole, which form such an important part of the fabric of this community, have seen very negative impacts because of this pandemic. And we wanted to make funding available to some of our existing neighborhood business associations and also in entities that might be interested in working with those business associations to have funding available for marketing efforts and promotional activities, basically bringing people back to these business districts that have been so decimated by the pandemic with a nod to really taking a look at what opportunity exists to help bring entrepreneurs of color into some neighborhood business districts that maybe uh, have not been uh, home to many of these entrepreneurs historically. Finally, we have funding for a downtown vacant storefront art program. Downtown is seeing a record number of vacancies, and we recognize that it's going to take a few years to bring back downtown to the, the better post-pandemic downtown that we all want to see. We also know that uh, our creative economy, our artists have been so negatively impacted by this pandemic, and this is an opportunity we hope to be able to 
help support some of our artists in this time of their need, as well as enliven some of these vacant storefronts over the next couple of years. And we look forward to working uh, with our partners downtown on implementing this program uh, over the next several months. The funds through the ARPA allocation for small business and, and neighborhood revitalization will be dispersed in, in a variety of different means. Uh, certainly uh, work with the Public Market Foundation will be through a direct contract, but work for through the Building Retail Improvement Grant Program, the Neighborhood Business District Support Program, and the SBER Support Program will continue to be through an application process where interested businesses and business districts will be able to apply to the city for funding. Over the next couple of months, we will be working on finalizing the program guidelines and the application materials for those efforts, and those will be made available uh, to the public and to our business community, again, to apply for that support. Uh, there's many stakeholders uh, that are engaged in our small business community, obviously the business owners themselves, uh, but also many uh, chambers of commerce and business associations that we work with on a regular basis. And uh, we look forward to continuing uh, working with them uh, as well as all of our neighbors uh, throughout the city of Madison to really build back to better in our small business community. Thank you again. Thanks, Matt. So that uh, is the last of the projects that we're highlighting today. Uh, so I will turn it back over to Christine to wrap us up. Great, thanks so much, Mayor. Um, so uh, for those of you who are watching, thank you again for uh, joining us this evening. Um, we really would like to hear from you to hear how about the what you thought about the town hall and how we can improve our communications about the budget process as well as what's most important to you. Um, so there's a link on the slides that we will also be posting on our website. Um, it's through SurveyMonkey, um, and it'll give it has a few short questions that will give you a chance to provide some feedback. And then on the next slide, again, all of our information will, will be posted on the city's webpage, which is cityofmadison.com/arpa. Here you can find a copy of the resolution that was adopted by the Common Council that has um, the the allocations by each of the five priorities that we discussed tonight, as well as a more detailed report on the 2021 ARPA allocations um, that includes information on the process for distributing funds, such as which proposals will go through an RFP process. And we'll be continuously updating this website with more information as it becomes available and as RFPs are released. Um, so on the final slide, I just want to say thank you for all of the members of the public who've joined us today, um, to the mayor uh, and city staff who've been presenting information tonight, um, to the Common Council for supporting our plans for the, the funding. Um, and I just appreciate everyone being involved, and we hope to continue this ongoing communication and engagement around the city budget and federal funds. So thank you and have a great evening.